Hello and welcome to a new episode of A Flat Pack History of Sweden. Yes, this is episode 22, Erik Segersel, the first Swedish king? Hmm, question there. Yep, question mark included. We've got a lot to get through today. It's a very exciting episode, it's been really fun to research, and we're going to talk about a very interesting man called Erik Segersel, who often gets the credit, or at least sometimes gets the credit, for being the first Swedish king. So that's something we're going to look into this week, see if he actually is or not, and I think we should probably just get cracking and start with the Swedish phrase. We shall! I really look forward to this week's phrase, uh, partly because I like it as a phrase, I use it when I speak Swedish, but mainly because it becomes really, really funny when you translate it to English. Yeah, this is one of those phrases that becomes really funny when you take it out of its Swedish everyday context and translate it into English and try and use it then because it becomes a bit weird and, like you said, really funny. And we got a message on Facebook recently saying that people actually are trying to use their English versions of the phrases in their day-to-day -day life, so this is definitely one you're going to be able to use. The phrase is Finst de hjerte rum, finst de hjerte rum. Now that translates to English as, if there is room in the heart, there is room for the butt. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> yeah, and obviously depending on who you are, your butt might be of different sizes. Yeah, but maybe it'll make more sense if I explain what the phrase means. Uh, it means that there will always be room for someone that you hold dear. So if you have room for someone in your heart, emotionally, you will have room for their butt, physically, meaning that you'll have the physical space to welcome them, or rather you make that physical space for them because you have room for them in your heart. Say you're a bunch of friends meeting up in a pub and all the seats are taken around the table, but then an extra friend comes around and they spot that there's no seat for them, so you all squeeze together and like find a chair for that new friend and make, make sure that that person is included as well because you have room for them in your heart, you now have room for them around the table. So then you can use the phrase, oh, let's squeeze up. If there's room in the heart, there's room for the butt. Yeah, but perhaps not the best phrase or practical advice to give during a global pandemic. No, definitely. Nowadays, we should stay further away from each other, maintaining social distance and all of that. So, because if there's room in the heart, there's no room for the butt. <laughs> that is the disclaimer now during Corona. Uh, just because you have room for someone in your heart, Maybe don't make room for their butt. Wait till we're in a better place with the COVID-19 pandemic and then we can start applying this lovely, albeit slightly weird, Swedish phrase again. Or, you know, have virtual butts mm -hmm. on a uh, Zoom or a Skype call or something like that. Yeah, well, how about we make room for Erik Segosel's butt now? As Chris said, it is the man who is sometimes credited as being the first king of Sweden. Yeah, because we said last time we were wrapping up the Viking Age, which we were in a sort of thematic sense, but strictly chronologically speaking, we're definitely still there at the moment, and Erik Segersel is a Viking leader. Because the period we're looking at right now, with his time being in charge, and also, spoilers, his son next time, we're very much still in the Viking Age, albeit much nearer the end than the beginning. Indeed it is. When we talk about these first kings, we're in the late 900s, early 1000s, so still in what we usually refer to as the Viking Age, which has another few decades still left to run. And Sweden, like we talked about in the previous episode, is much smaller at this point than the Sweden we think of today. Really, it's just an area in the south-central part of Sweden, along with the east coast of the country. As we saw in the previous episode, Sweden isn't really a unified one country, one kingdom, one legal system yet. Power structures are still fragmented and political power is much more local. But this does begin to change at the end of the Viking period by the time Erik takes charge of his group of people in around 970. 
In comparison, Sweden's neighbors, Denmark and Norway, had actually come a lot further in their state-making process, if we want to call it that. By 970, they were well on their way to being proper entities, kingdoms, relatively clearly defined on a map. And Chris, I know you've been looking into their backgrounds a bit for this week to give us a bit of context for the region. Yes, because their stories are very heavily entwined with the next couple of episodes. Yeah, and next couple of episodes, but also as we'll see throughout history, if you do a history of Sweden like we do, you definitely need to often bring in Denmark, Norway, Finland, the countries that surround us, what makes up the Nordic countries, because we are very intertwined with each other. Shall we start with Denmark? Absolutely. Welcome to Denmark. By the time we reach Erik Sagersal, Denmark has had roughly the same territorial boundaries for quite a while now, with this being the limits of modern-day Denmark plus a sort of greater scorner over in modern-day Sweden. Gorm the Old, the excellently named proper historically recognised king of Denmark, was around in 936 and lived until 958 or so. Although we do have records of king sounding people, people who are given the name king from the time of Ansgar, if you think back to the story of our travelling archbishop in episode 12, so there's definitely a sort of gradual progression in what we could call a king of Denmark. Gorm's son, Harold Bluetooth, also excellently named, then ruled as king of Denmark from 958. Harold reintroduced Christianity to Denmark after a few experiments in Ansgar's time, and he consolidated his rule over most of what is now called Jutland and Zealand, the main territories of Denmark. Harold also had a short rule as King of Norway following the assassination of a Norwegian king, but this reign was more tenuous and probably only lasted for a few years in direct rule. But he still had most of the Oslo Fjord area and allies ruled the rest of the country for him. He was typically listed as the King of Norway for around five years or so from 970 to 975. When compared to what we see Eric doing later in this episode, Harold is absolutely doing kingly things during his reign. He's using his political, economic and military majesty to great effect, something that Eric doesn't seem to be able to do as much, at least judging by big archaeological remains that we have. One of these giant archaeological remains that we do have is Harold overseeing the construction of one of the Yelling Runic Stones. His father Gorm had built the first Yelling Rune Stone as a monument to his wife, but Harold's sequel is absolutely gigantic. It's easily the side of a small car, if not bigger, and it was dedicated to the memory of his parents whilst also celebrating his conquest of Denmark and Norway as well as mentioning his conversion of the Danes to Christianity, is a true monument in every sense of the word, and one that I'd love to go and see. Got a photo of the two rune stones here that I'm going to show to Orsa because she hasn't seen it yet, so... Wow! Yeah, that is... that is huge! It's like a boulder. It really is. Yeah, no, definitely that's on the, on the list for future holiday destinations now. Yeah, we might have to quickly sneak over into Denmark uh, to have a look at the Yelling Runestones. But other projects that Harold was getting on with during his rule was building the fortress of Aros, the modern-day Aarhus, right in the middle of his kingdom at the end of the 970s. And a number of ring forts were built in other strategic locations around Aarhus, implying that Harold was using these fortifications to continually reinforce and consolidate his economic and military control of his country and the main city. He definitely sounds like a proper king, definitely more medieval king than Viking ruler in that sense, I suppose. Someone who's building things, instigating large projects, someone who had that kind of overall rule rather than strong rule over a small local territory. Yeah, absolutely. And this is something that we'll definitely come back to when we see relations between Denmark and Norway later on in the episode. 
Yeah, do you want to continue with our friends up in Norway? Yes, definitely. Now on to Norway. Welcome to Norway. In the mid-800s, Norway was made up of a great many petty kingdoms, small areas ruled by local people looking after local problems, and usually by men called Jarls. By the early 900s, it had been united by the historically dubious Harald Fairhair, at some point between the 870s and 930. Yeah, I mean, we're talking about a 50-year period, Harald Fairhair, or Harald Hörsagre, as he's known in Sweden. He is an interesting character, but yeah, we don't actually know if he was around. So yeah, I think, I like the phrase, historically dubious. Yes, I think it's, this is the perfect phrase for pretty much this entire episode. Um, but Harold's sons, Eric Bloodax and Hawkon the Good, then took power over a number of years, with the throne passing from Bloodax to Hawkon the Good, skipping Eric's son. I mean, you imagine they had quite different personalities, giving two such different epithets or like nicknames one's called blood axe and one's called the good ah uh, but good at what good at blood axing people to death maybe good um, point yeah but I, I don't think that's the reason why so drama really begins in the 950s when a chap called harold gray cloak or harold gray hide enters the stage he was the son of eric blood axe so he probably felt like he deserved the throne himself the bad news for Hawkon the Good was that Harold's mother was the sister of Harold Bluetooth down in Denmark, and so he had an alliance with the Danish king through blood, and the two family members worked together to get Greycloak on the Norwegian throne. The Allied forces fought several battles against King Hawkon, including the Battle of Rastaklav near the island of Frey in 955, and the Battle of Fitya in 961, where King Hawkon was killed. Harald Greycloak and his brothers then become joint leaders of Norway, backed by the power of Harald Bluetooth, but they had little real authority outside of Western Norway, as the country started to fragment a bit again back to its roots of petty kingdoms. Being the oldest brother, Harold was the most powerful and nominally in charge. However, in 961, their uncle Harold Bluetooth travelled personally to Norway and declared publicly that Harold Greycloak was to be his vassal king in Norway, effectively saying that he was the true king of Norway, but he didn't have time to rule it because he was busy looking after Denmark. Harold Greycloak then brutally murders the close advisors of his predecessor, Hawkon the Good, hoping to cement his claim to power. Wow, this is so intense, but also potentially a bad move, right? Absolutely, because in 970, the year where we will properly start Sweden's chronology in this episode with Eric Siegersell's rise to power, Howard Greycloak was then tricked to coming down to Denmark and killed in a plot planned by the son of Harkon's most trusted advisor, who had also become an ally of Harold Bluetooth. So they're all playing together in this political game. This son was then installed by Harold Bluetooth as the next vassal king of Norway, so the man at the top of the tree hasn't really changed too much, he's just supporting different factions underneath him. So absolute was Harold Bluetooth's power during this period, he's actually listed as the legitimate king of Norway for some of this time, like I mentioned earlier. He's not just a puppet master working from Denmark the whole time. In fact, Norway was ruled by the Danish king's proxies for around 25 years or so, before they get another truly Norwegian king back again. So yes, by the time Eric Segersel arrives, this second vassal king is in charge, and Harald Bluetooth is without doubt the big bogeyman next door, with his fingers in the Danish and Norwegian pies. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that was quite detailed, but hopefully easy enough to follow. Thank you very much, Chris. Like... We said it is important to have a bit of a contextual idea of what's going on around Sweden as well. Yeah, so that's what these neighbours were up to, and what Sweden looks like when our main man Eric enters the stage. I think now you can see why it makes sense to have finished our wrapping up of the Viking Age last time around, because effectively from now on we will be on this properly chronological journey all the way up to the modern day, and it will be quite hard to deviate 
too long and too much from the narrative without getting down many rabbit holes. But we will still be doing uh, thematic episodes as we go on relevant subjects, but just not spending 10 episodes to look into one subject. Yeah, definitely. So now that we have the background sorted, before we start talking about Eric's life, there are two quick things we should cover. First of all, his name, Segosiel, and then his credit as being the first king of Sweden. Uh, something we'll come back to at the end of the episode too. But first, maybe quickly, just the name. Eric is obviously his first name, but Segosel is not his surname. He's not Eric Segosel like Susan Ivanova or Michael Garibaldi. Rather, Segosel is a credit he gets or a nickname, otherwise known as an epithet. It'd be like if I were known as Osa the podcaster. The podcaster isn't my surname, it's something that I am known for. In fact, quite a few of the early Swedish kings, and indeed the early Norwegian and Danish kings, like we saw with people called Blood Axe, they had these epithets, added names that aren't their surnames. So, Segosel, what does that mean? Well, let's do a quick Swedish etymology of the word. It can be broken down into two parts. First, Segel means victory in Swedish. The second part, Sel, is a word we rarely use today, but it means sort of happy or blessed. So that would mean that he's called Erik the Blessed with Victory. Or as in pretty much every modern history book, they've decided to call him Erik the Victorious. In English, yeah, that's much easier. I noticed that he's also called Erik the Victorious in uh, the English Wikipedia entrance about him. And I mean, Wikipedia is always the trusted source, isn't it? Yeah, Wikipedia is the bastion of the truth. By having this name, I guess we can assume that he's earned at least one victory to get this nickname. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll see. He does have at least one victory. Spoilers. <laughs> yeah. Or maybe they just decided to focus on the positive when they gave him that nickname. Yeah, maybe. Um, um, but we said earlier that Eric Segersel often gets credited as being the first king of Sweden. One major reason is because this is when we just begin to get a lot of real accurate, or at least semi-accurate, sources. He's mentioned in these legitimate historical documents, like those written by Adam of Bremen, who we've referenced quite a few times now with his history of the Archbishops of Bremen. This means that we can confirm who he was to a certain extent, what he did in general, and can begin to question if the extent of his power covered enough area to be called the King of Sweden. Like a lot of the earlier kings, such as King Björn mentioned in Ansgar's episode at Birka, these were quite likely real people in a very, very generic sense, and an indication of the types of rulers of areas like Birka might have had. But they certainly wouldn't have had the wider reach and true majesty and legal backing that a ruler like Eric Segersel might have when he comes to power. And so that's why those people really can't be seen as being a king over anything really even close to what would be resembling a country or a state. Now, that being said, it's not like we're actually drowning in good and reliable sources when we come to Segersel either. A lot of what we do know is quite vague, and it's difficult to establish things for certain. Plus, Adam of Bremen himself isn't entirely accurate, as well as the other sources we'll mention later. The fact that a lot of this information is quite vague, or otherwise downright contradictory, is why quite a lot of people dispute his title as the first king of Sweden, giving that to his son. After we look at his life, we'll come back to this question at the end of the episode and decide if we think he does deserve to be called the first king. But in general, this type of debate around the veracity of our information is still going to keep popping up until quite a way into the podcast. Yeah, this will definitely continue to be the case for really quite a lot of episodes going forward, at least until we get to the later part of the medieval period. 
But yeah, now that we've mentioned these two things and the sort of precarious nature around sources, let's get on with looking at Eric Segosel's life. So most of what we do know about Eric the Victorious, we know because he is mentioned in the writings of Adam of Bremen and a number of the Icelandic sagas. Adam of Bremen calls him Herseus Victor. Herseus is probably a Latinization of Eric and Victor, and then we're back to the Latin for Victorious. So he's mentioned again in these few Icelandic sagas, like the Heimskringla, which has quite a lot to say about him and his family members. And some of the events in his life also get mentioned in runestones, which have been found up around Stockholm and down in modern-day Skorna. So let's begin at the beginning. We don't know where he was born or exactly when. Could start. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if there are few sources in general about his life, there are none about his early life. But later historians have estimated that Segosel would be born no later than the year 945. Just because when he arrives on the scene at 970 and starts doing kingy things, he would be 25. Yeah, he might have been born earlier, but not much later. That wouldn't make sense. Uh, he might have been the son of someone called Björn. Uh, there are some Icelandic sources that mention that, but the validity of these are uncertain. Uh, he could also have been the son of Eamund Eriksson, who Adam of Bremen mentions as being the ruler of the Swedish people before Segosel, but it's not a given that he took over from his father, so that just because of who the previous ruler was, it's not certain that that was Segosel's dad. Yeah, as we've seen lots of times in this period and just in the brief summary of the kings of Denmark and Norway, it's not, as you said, it's not always the son that inherits. So we don't know if Segesel was born into power or if he rose to power on his own or with the help of others. And this path to power could be fragmented, locally focused on the area of Sweden at the time, or it could have been quite straightforward and easy. We, we don't really know. But what we do know is that he's consistently described as a mighty and strong warrior, so most likely he wasn't afraid to pick up a sword to either establish or consolidate his rule. We also don't know exactly how and when he rises to a suitable position of power where we can start to give him credit as being a king or quasi-king. There's no definite date and no coronation attended by diplomats or anything like that. But judging by the events we do know happen and piecing together this very vague puzzle, we can assume that this happens sometime around 970 in, in the early 970s. Most sources, including even the websites of local councils in Sweden, give the start date as around 970. Yeah, so he's described as mighty and having a mighty realm ruling over a large area, and indeed, Segosel is the first ruler that gets credit for controlling the area of Svealand, along with the counties of Vestergötland and Östergötland. So basically, that's that whole bit of central Sweden at the time, both around the Lake Mälaren, the more Svealand area, and further south and southwest around the lakes Vänern and Vietton, potentially all the way up to the west coast near Norway. And up until then, these had been separate areas with local rulers, and it's not until Erik Segosel that we see them united under one ruler that he does get the credit for. And this is important because controlling this large range of land matters a lot to any ruler. The area around and between uh, these two lakes, Venon and Vietton, is very fertile. It's still where we have a lot of our domestic food production and cultivations to this day. And in a rural and agrarian society like Sweden was in the Viking Age and medieval times, having control over this land would strengthen your position a lot. You need that breadbasket to, uh, to stay in power. 
In fact, during Segelstel's reign and later the reign of his son, we'll see how Vestergötland becomes more important still. Yes, and starting our chronology of Segelstel's rule, we know that pretty much the first thing he did was establish the town of Sigtuna, and it's on the Sigtuna local council website that says that he began being a king in 970 because of this. So if they say it, I think that must be the definitive source. And Sigtuna is still very much around today, hence the council website, and it's got about 8,000 inhabitants. And it's about 45 minutes drive north of Stockholm. Yeah, in fact, if you ever visit Sweden and you fly into the main national airport, the Stockholm airport, uh, or Arlanda as it's called, you'll land not far at all from Sigtuna, just about 15 minutes outside of the town towards Stockholm. Yeah, so Sigasel establishes a town here. It's very well located on the shores of Lake Melleran, and you're able to reach the Baltic Sea from here quite easily, but at the same time it's not right on the east coast of Sweden facing the Baltic Sea, so you're protected from direct immediate coastal attacks from other Vikings as well. At the same time, Birka, the amazing Viking trading town and place that we talked about in a couple of episodes now, starts to diminish and it looks like it's losing its place as an important town and trading post before it effectively disappears completely. We'll talk more about this decline of Birka and the emergence and founding of Sigtuna in another episode, but there are a number of fascinating stories about why this might have happened, ranging from dramatic battles and burning down of Birka to more political and economic reasons. Yeah, and we can't say for sure why, but Sigtuna seems to be taking Birka's place. Some historians have argued that this is a sign that royal power was being strengthened at the time, and that the two places, Sigtuna and Birka, were connected. But when the king sort of chose Sigtuna, that meant that one gained importance and the other lost, and Sigtuna had a better potential for expansion, perhaps, seeing as it's on the mainland and it's not restricted by being on quite a small island like Birka was. Yeah, for Birka to expand, it would basically take over the entire island, so that's potentially not very practical, but much more on this um, in a future episode. As king and ruler, Segesel was keen to maintain a network of contacts with rulers in other neighbouring areas. This includes his family connections and wives that we'll see in a bit. This way of working is also an indication of his power, that we see that he was the one that established and maintained these connections with other rulers, meaning that he spoke for the Swedish people, say, and held the power of Sweden when representing his area of the world in relation with foreign powers and neighbours. He seemed to have cared in particular about relations to the East, which would make sense. He stayed in touch with those living abroad who claimed Swedish roots, like the rulers of Kiev, and maintained relations and alliances with rulers in what is modern-day Poland. Some of these alliances, both with areas in the East and areas within Sweden itself, seem to have been something that Segesel maintained via a marriage, or potentially marriages. We'll talk more about his wife, or should I say possible wives, plural, uh, later on, but it's likely that he used marriages to cement his claim to alliances. On the opposite end of the spectrum, though, Segesel also has enemies. He has two main enemies in particular, one being a person close to him, and the other one being a nation. The nation is an enemy that you'll see will become the enemy time and time again throughout Swedish history. Who do you think it is, Chris? Well, judging by what we've spoke about so far in the episode, could it quite potentially be Denmark? Of course it's Denmark! It's always Denmark. Nowadays, we might fight our battles against Denmark, well, almost exclusively on the football pitch, and otherwise maintain close and friendly relationships with our neighbours across the Öresund Strait, uh, especially down south, where I'm from. But throughout Swedish history, Denmark was arch-enemy number one. 
And in the case of Segesel and his animosity towards Denmark is pretty much personified in the shape of his opposite numbers. Danish ruler Harald Bluetooth and then his son Sven Tverfweg, or Sven Forkbeard as he's known in English. I mean, could we just pause for a second and talk about what an extremely cool nickname that is? Fork beard. Yeah, I presume that his beard looked like a fork and rather didn't have a fork stuck in it. <laughs> yeah, I'm assuming. So, Tverfweg in Swedish it translates to like two beards. So, like, I'm imagining that he had two sub side beards. But, but well, not necessarily side beards, just a bit of the chin is poking out in two different ways. Yeah. Like, I've even tried to do that with my beard when it was got quite long, but it didn't work very well. <gasps> oh, so you can't be Chris Fork Beard. No. You'll just be Chris Uni Beard. Yeah. Also, Bluetooth, I think, deserves a special mention. That's a very cool nickname. Eric the Victorious doesn't think that Harold and Mr. Forkbeard are too great at all. On the contrary, they're at odds with each other, and it will eventually lead to a lot of dramatic military action at sea. But first, probably a few years before Sven is even king of Denmark, when Bluetooth was still on the throne, we have the event which gives Eric the Victorious his claim to victorious fame, the Battle of Theorisvallana. This battle took place in the mid-980s, some sources say 983, some 984, and some 985, so we're not sure of the exact date. As always, the sources are varying a lot, as we mentioned before, but it's sometime in the middle of the 980s, and at least we know where this one took place. Fyrsvalana was a large open plain just south of Uppsala, so in the same general area of Sigtuna and north of Stockholm. And the plain was alongside the Fyrisorn River. The name actually means the Valley of Fyrisorn. And in this battle, he was up against a group of Vikings from Skorna. So Danish Vikings! Yeah, of course, as because this was the area of Denmark at the time, and it seems like some of the Vikings were either provided or at least coming with the explicit approval of the Danish king, Harald Bluetooth. We don't know the real sort of military details of the Battle of Fierasvallana, but some of the concrete details are mentioned on some rude stones down in Skorna. In fact, one of them is not far from Ustad, where Orsa is from. Yeah, that's not far at all. I think I've passed that rune stone by several times, but I've never thought to stop and have a look at what it actually says. We'll have to check it out next time we're in the area. Yeah, well, luckily some other people have put it online on the internet, so we don't have to drive all the way there to find out what it says. That is fortunate, because it's about an eight-hour drive. Yeah, um, but there are a few mentions on other runestones as well, and there are also accounts in Icelandic sagas, which, as we know, were written much later, but may have at least a hint of real detail in them. We know that Sergesel fought these Vikings from Skorna, and they were actually led by Sergesel's nephew. Wow, this could possibly be the first verified family feud in Swedish history. Segelsel's nephew was called Stilbjörn the Strong, which is also a great name. Some sources suggest that he was angry at Eric for taking the throne and stopping him from getting on the throne, as it might have been Stilbjörn's father who was king before Eric Segelsel or whatever we call the throne at this point, who was in charge as a ruler. So that's a very classic historical reason for getting into war. Families fighting over power. However, what is not so great is that historians have placed doubt on the existence of this potential father, and even doubt the existence of the nephew Stilbjörn himself. Yes, well, whoever Stierbjorn was, or who he was based on, and what motives were behind his reason to go to battle, there is a battle. And Segesel is, like his name indicates, victorious. One Icelandic saga says that the reason he won the battle was because before the battle began, he promised the god Thor that if he won, he would give himself to Odin within ten years, i.e. he would die and his body would be a tribute to Odin. Stierbjorn had set sail for Sweden with a host of Danish Vikings, some of them maybe coming from the Danish king himself, as we said, and set about trying to defeat Erik and take control of Sweden. 
Supposedly, the battle lasted for three days, with the first few engagements on the first few days ending in a stalemate. And there's also a crazy story about the Swedes tying cows together and kitting them out with spears and swords, so they're sort of like a cow battering ram and pushing them towards the Danes. I mean, seriously? That's... <laughs> so I'm just having this mental image of, like, you, you attach a spear on the head of a cow and then you force it to charge towards your enemy like a evil cow unicorn yeah i think that's exactly what they're trying to, to, also, to say what happened also cows are the worst animals to use cows are famously uncooperative yeah but they also charge at you at least the bulls don't they so we don't so, really know I, I still don't i think this might have been one of the stupider ideas of military history it, it, it sounds very much like what olga did back in kiev with the the birds and the various tricks and things but apparently on the third day the swedes win the battle thanks to a storm of arrows flying at the danes and when the battle was all but over and the swedes victorious stierbjorn cries out in defiance and charges at the swedes with the remnants of his bodyguards and loyal soldiers despite knowing that he would die and he dies in this valiant show of bravery and final charge and this action is what is commemorated on the rune stones we mentioned earlier that are found down in Skorne, where the losing vikings would have come from three in particular are worth quoting so there's the hellestad rune stone that says askel placed this stone in memory of toki gorm's son to him a faithful lord he did not flee at Uppsala. Then there's the Sjörup runestone that Chris mentioned that reads, Saxi placed this stone in memory of Asbjörn, Tuki's son. He did not flee at Uppsala, but slaughtered as long as he had a weapon. And finally, on the Högby runestone, it says, The good freeman Gulli had five sons. The brave champion Osmoon fell on the 30. So, yeah, there definitely seems to be a dramatic battle and some sort of last stand and final brave engagement is mentioned by these Skånska Vikings family members who are raising the runestones from them. So they seem to have been pretty brave and dramatic, at least judging by what their family wants to write about them. Absolutely. And a bit of a spoiler, uh, Eric's promise to Thor did come true, in a sense at least. The Battle of Fyrisvalana took place in the mid- 880s and Erik Segelsel didn't die until sometime in 994 or 995. Well, it could just be a coincidence. Yeah, but the result of this story is that he wins the Battle of Fyris Valana and he has fought off the rival to his power. Yes, and he must be feeling pretty happy with his victory. Some sources do mention another possible battle between Eric the Victorious and someone called Hunding a few years later, but that's pretty much all that we know. So it isn't really considered a proper battle in most modern history books. So at this point, Eric Segesel has consolidated his power and fought off his angry family member and is claiming himself to be the ruler of Sweden. What happens next, though, according to Adam of Bremen, is that Eric actually becomes the ruler of a large amount of Danish territory as well. This is because he senses an opening down south in Denmark now that this large army of Danish Skånska Vikings has been defeated. In Denmark, new king Sven Forkbeard isn't at full strength either, as he's just fought against his dad, Harold Bluetooth, in a coup to get the Danish throne. So, whilst we don't know the details, it seems clear that Segosel is mighty, he's powerful and very interested in conquering. He is confident in his own abilities. There appear to be a number of dramatic naval battles between the two sets of Vikings before Sven Folkbeard admits defeat and leaves Denmark entirely and potentially leads a very dramatic exile all around the North Sea. 
Segel Cell managed to get not just this larger area of Sweden, larger than any previous ruler under his control, but he also gets part of Denmark. Uh, Adam of Bremen says, quote, Eric, the most mighty king of the Swedes, collected an army as innumerable as the sands of the sea and invaded Denmark. Sven, abandoned by God and vainly trusting in his idols, went to meet him. The two forces joined in many naval battles, for thus is how that folk is prone to fight, and the whole Danish force was crushed. The victorious King Eric seized Denmark, and Sven driven from his realm. Nice and dramatic from Adam of Bremen there. So this basically says that Eric has Denmark, and it's during this time that he converts to Christianity for a bit. Yeah, and this is important for several reasons, partly because this is one of the reasons we know more about Segosel than any previous ruler. This is why Adam of Bremen, who's a bishop, likes at least a small bit of him and therefore writes about him. But it's also why later historians have considered him important. Sweden was a very religious, very Christian country for centuries, and so historians back then liked to focus on our Christian history, not those pesky pagans that had come before. It also indicates how Christianity has got a hold of different areas, because it's not until Segesel starts to rule over more southern territories like Vestergötland and all the way down to Denmark, where Christianity has a stronger foothold, that he decides to convert. Finally, which we'll see in more of the coming episodes, is how Christianity, unlike when our friend Ansgar first came to Sweden hundreds of years earlier, is now introduced in a more top-down approach. It's now the king, or the ruler, or the chieftains who convert, and then the others follow suit, rather than the other way around. Although in Sagasau's case, his conversion doesn't actually seem to spur any major move towards Christianity, as this will come later. Well, that's probably because he reverts back to paganism after just a few years. Uh, sometime between 990 and his death in either late 994 or early 995, Segosel seems to have said, you know what, I don't fancy being Christian anymore, I'm going back to Odin and his gang. And this seems to coincide with him losing control over these Danish territories and sees the return of Sven Forkbeard. So maybe it's the case that Christianity is no longer expedient or necessary for Eric as he's not controlling Christianized Denmark anymore. And he doesn't need that religion to help him control his people back in Sweden. So he's not going to bother anymore. This change also means that Eric re isn't really seen as the first Christian king of Sweden. That's something that is given to his son, and also doubly so because he might not have even technically been the first king. Yeah. Either way, there isn't really any more information on Eric Segesel's activities, and he dies in old Uppsala in either 994 or 995 thus ending the reign of the first person that we know enough about to do a whole episode on, but that also had extensive enough powers to potentially be credited as the first king of Sweden. So that's great to have ticked off potentially the first Swedish king, and we've made a start, and it's great to have finally made it to the point where we know a little bit about these people, at least enough to give a good stab at writing a biography of them. Definitely. So Segosel dies, and his son, Iulof Hjöldkjörnung, takes over, and he'll be the focus of our next episode. In fact, Hjöldkjörnung had co-ruled with his father for the last years of his reign, so he had a bit of practice in that regard. But actually, speaking of his son, I think we should say a few more words about Erik Segosel's family. Yeah, because there's a bit of a big question mark over his wives, isn't there? There is, but before we get to the wife, or perhaps wives, we should just quickly mention his children. So Erik Segosel definitely has a son, Ulof Sjöldkjörnung, who we just mentioned, who becomes the next king. But he might also have had one more son and perhaps a daughter. 
But like we said, it's really with his wives where it gets interesting because he might have had two. At the same time? <laughs> no, probably not. Either he was married to one after the other, or, which is more likely, he was only married to one and the other one is a mistake, uh, or even maybe the same person just being called different names. Either way, they're both pretty good stories. Yeah, so we have two contenders for the title of Wife of Eric Segesel. Would you like to start us off? Yes, the first one, which is what most sources state, is that he was married to the daughter of a Slavic prince. Uh, one suggested name for this wife is Gunhild, who would have been the daughter of Prince Mieszko I of Poland, and also the sister of Boleslav I of Poland. This would make sense, since we know how keen Segosel was to form alliances with other rulers around the Baltic Sea, especially towards the east, and certainly in forming these alliances against his nemesis Sven Folkbeard. So that is why it would make sense that he formed a marriage alliance with rulers in Poland. But then the funny thing is that his nemesis, Sven Folkbeard, was also married to the daughter of a Slavic prince, a woman who was potentially also called Gunhild. So for two men who strongly disliked each other, they might have had a very similar taste in women, at least. Yeah, at least a taste in women called Gunhild. Or stuff gets lost during the course of history. That's also a probable explanation. Yeah, um, potentially more likely, as we'll see in a minute. Um, so who's the other option for his wife? Yes, this one, this option is that he was married to Sigrid the Haughty, who is also potentially a later wife of his enemy Sven Falkbeard. Okay, this is getting super confusing. Uh, Sigrid the Haughty is a name that some of our listeners might recognise if they listen to Rex Factor, as that was a recent episode from them ranking the queens of England. And Sigrid the Haughty is a fascinating character that I definitely recommend you read up more on. Uh, according to Heimskringler, the epic saga, Sigrid was the daughter of a Swedish noble in Västergötland called Skuglar Toste or Tosti. Västergötland was an area that we know was important to Segosel as it was close to Norway and a natural area where he would have wanted to establish a strong power base. So again, it would make sense that he was interested in forming alliances through marriage to influential people in that area. Uh, this version of Sigrid marrying Erik and having a child with him means that their child becomes the next and potentially first king of Sweden, Olof Röthkonung. But then, if we go to Adam of Bremen, he also claims that a woman called Sigrid the Haughty is the wife of Eric and mother of Olof Hrothkonung. But he claims that Sigrid is actually a Polish noble, the sister or daughter of Boleslav I of Poland, we mentioned earlier as the father of this woman called Gunhild that could have been the wife of Erik Segosel. Yeah, so you can see why this is getting a bit confusing, because nobody can agree with anyone else uh, in and, the sources. And they seem to also just get the names and people mixed up. It's very confusing. And if you're confused, that's good, because Adam also says later that after being Eric's wife, Sigrid became the mother of Knut the Great and Harold II of Denmark in her second marriage with Sven Thorkbid. A third source, Thietmar of Merseborg, states that an unnamed sister of Boleslav married Sven Thorkbid and gave him two sons, but doesn't mention any previous relationship with Eric. This is all incredibly murky. Um, Adam of Bremen's 
claim about any marriage between a Polish Sigrid and Eric are considered unreliable by many historians. He is the only person to claim that a Polish princess, whatever her name, was married to a Swedish king. And remember, the Heimskringla says that Sigrid was actually Swedish and Thietmar doesn't mention a Swedish king. But anyway, what I really like about Sigrid the Haughty and what I was very keen to mention today is something that takes place after her potential marriage to Erik Segosel, but before any potential marriage to Sven Folkbid. So, after Erik's death, Sigrid returned back home to Västergötland as a widow. She supposedly became very rich, and as a very rich, eligible widower, she receives many proposals. Apparently, she was proposed to by both a Norwegian king and by a Russian king, but turned them both down because she thought they were too inferior. In fact, she didn't just turn them down, she then burned them alive by setting a house on fire. That seems uncalled for and potentially a bit exaggerated. Yeah, I mean, just because you don't want to date someone, don't set them on fire. We will continue her story later because it intertwines with her sons. And we can say that there is a lot more drama between Denmark, Norway and Sweden in the next few episodes. Absolutely. But before we move on and talk about those stories in the next episode, should we quickly pop back to the question about who were Eric's wives? I guess we'll never know for sure which one of the two he was married to. It sounds more likely that she was a local Swedish noble, with Eric using his marriage to negotiate more power in his gradually expanding realm, because if he's potentially the first Swedish king, he might not even be secure enough at that point to enter in grand alliances abroad when he can't even keep control over his own area. But either way, it seems like he had a powerful woman by his side, so that's great. And we just can't confirm her name, nationality, life story, age, or anything. Yeah. But what we can do is briefly summarise the life and reign of Erik Segosel. Absolutely. So he came to power, potentially after the death of his father. He founds the city of Sigtuna and oversees the gradual disappearance of Birka, something we'll look into more in coming weeks. Uh, whatever the circumstances of his accession and exactly the reason for the confrontation, Eric's nephew, Styrbjörn, tries to take the kingdom about a decade later, resulting in this dramatic battle of Furis Valana. Eric wins, potentially with the divine help of Thor, and starts to rule a consolidated Sweden, having defeated Styrbjörn's Danish army. Erik then sails to Denmark and defeats and exiles Sven Forkbeard from Denmark and he rules the kingdom for a short period of time. He is testing out Christianity for a while before returning to paganism and at some point he has a son, which will become the focus of our next episode, a son called Olof Sjötkonung. Apart from that, there isn't too much we can say for certain, and this is really why a lot of people ultimately come down on the side that it's actually Olof who is the first king of Sweden. Erik Segosel's son, Olof, he gets a lot more of the firsts, such as making the first coin, being the first truly Christian king, and so on, and that's why people, when it comes to the credit, first king of Sweden, that tends to go to Olof Wörtkonung, not his father, Erik Segosel. But this is definitely a great start to our chronology of the Swedish kings, regardless of whatever Erik's ultimate title ends up being in the history books. Exactly. It's a great start, and we will continue the dynasty next time, with his son, Olof, the politics between Norway, Denmark and Sweden take another few dramatic turns and it starts to get really 
murky and devious with plenty of battles. And of course, we'll, we'll see the return of the very feisty Sigrid the Haughty. Which I'm definitely looking forward to. But until then, don't forget to follow us on social media and leave a review on whatever platform you're listening to us on. And if you want more information on Sigrid with spoilers for next time, do listen to the excellent Rex Factor episode on her life or make-believe life, whatever you want to call it. But until next time, take care. Bye-bye. Hey, Dale.